The topic for this session is an overview of international progress on CBDCs, which we thought would be a good starting point to the day's agenda. Um, and I think to just set the scene a little bit, one of the questions I'm often asked is, why do we need new forms of digital money? Why do we need central bank digital currencies? After all, isn't the money we use today pretty much digital in any case? Um, you know, money is exchanged digitally through the exchange of messages between bank ledgers. Most of us are not transacting in cash day to day. What's the difference between a central bank digital currency and, and the money that we have today, for example? Um, well, part of that difference is the difference between commercial bank money and so private money and public money, which I think Dirk is going to, to talk a bit more about. Um, but also, fundamentally, the money that we have today, while it, it may be digital in its manifestation, is not digital native. It's still the systems of payments that we use, the money that we use, is still predicated on an assumption, even though there are not barrel, wheelbarrows full of cash being exchanged between banks at the end of the day. The systems and processes that they've all automated and digitized fundamentally are constrained by those kind of legacy assumptions at the end of, t of the day. And what central bank digital currencies and new forms of digital money give us an opportunity to do is look at the requirements that we have today and going into the future of money and of the payment systems that we use and look as well as the technology that we have available to us and try to create something new, something that can better address those requirements of today and tomorrow with the technology that we have available now. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that all of our panelists in this session are looking at, um, some from a more theoretical perspective, um, such as um, Professor Dirk Niepelt, from the University of Bern and the Center for Economic Policy Research, and some from a far more practical perspective, such as Nick Kerrigan, who's the Managing Director and Head of Innovation at SWIFT, and Francesca hopwood Road, who's the Head of the, Innovation, of the BIS Innovation Hub in London. Um, so the structure of this session um, is going to be, each of our panelists is going to give a very, uh, about a 10 minute presentation um, on their kind of areas of work and areas of focus and what they're exploring when it comes to central bank digital currencies. Um, we're then going to have a um, panel discussion of about 25 minutes and we'll leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for audience interaction and Q&A. Um, and it would be great if we can keep questions until the end. Um, we will have some roving mics going around so you'll be able to um, well, we'll be able to take as many questions as possible and hopefully you'll all, all have a chance to interact with the panel. Um, so let's get started. Dirk, would you like to come up? So um, thanks very much, Jenna. Thank you very much, um, all of you, for coming and having me. Let me get that right. So I'm just a macroeconomist, sorry about that. So I'd like to give you a macroeconomic perspective on retail CBDC, which very much rhymes with some of the themes that Michael gave us before. Um, as you know, there's quite clever and influential people who argue that CBDC actually is a solution in search of a problem. Chris Waller, for example, one of the Fed governors, uh, writes that, says that. The House of Lords report um, was very critical about what this is all about. And if you ask those people, they would say, quite convincingly, I guess, right, you should ask yourself questions of the type like, what is it that users could really gain from CBDC? Is there anything that the private sector would not be able to deliver equally well or much better? Aren't there other ways to deliver, actually, in, in, in much smarter and maybe more efficient ways than what CBDC uh, would be able to deliver? I think these questions are very well posed. Of course, we should ask those questions, but we should ask a bit broader questions. In particular, a lot of the discussion uh, that we hear from those people is that um, they're very much focused on consumer needs. What, what is it that is in for consumers with retail CBDC? I think we should be more open in that debate about also uh, business needs for uh, CBDC. But much more importantly, and that's really what I want to focus on, is we should not be focused too much only on what is there in for users, but what's in for taxpayers, for citizens. I think that's the main 
macroeconomic consideration that we should have in mind when thinking about um, retail central bank digital currency. So if you're a macroeconomist like me, you wonder about the whole system, the monetary system, and Michael raised these issues before. Um, so what is it really that retail CBDC would change in terms of the monetary architecture as we know it? You know that architecture is two-tiered. We are banking with banks using claims on commercial banks as a means of payment, and the banks amongst each other, they are paying each other using reserves, central bank issued um, money. That's the two-tier system we are living in. It's the fractional reserve banking that Michael raised. And it's a system in which we have a pretty stark division between public money on the one hand, the money issued by government, by central banks, and private money, which is much more important for the real economy, the money issued by commercial banks. Now that distinction is not very much on the minds of people, as we also just heard, with a few exceptions. For example, in Switzerland, people are aware of that now. Why are they aware of that now? Because a couple of years ago, there was this grassroots movement, the sovereign money movement, that actually wanted to change the constitution. And what they wanted to do is to have a sentence in the constitution that says, money on, uh, sorry, banks are not allowed to create money anymore. Two thirds of the Swiss thought that's a bad idea. One third of the Swiss thought that's pretty good idea, but one third was, was just one third. Um, I think it was a pretty bad idea because it's not clear at all how you could actually implement something like that. But the question these people ask is a good question, and I think one of the potential answers to those questions is retail CBDC. I listed here Milton Friedman as one of the intellectual, one of the potential intellectual uh, ancestors of these ideas among many other famous people, starting with the Chicago plan in the 1930s, also James Tobin in the 70s and 80s. What we get from that tradition of thinking is really that the typical banking perspective on money that we are often taught, like liquidity is scarce, we need banks to manage it very well, is sort of not the right perspective if you take a macroeconomic perspective. Because from a macroeconomic point of view, liquidity provided by the government is actually ample. Yeah? It's basically costless to provide that. So that's the, the banking perspective is not necessarily the right one to adopt. If you want to think about retail CBDC, therefore, from this macroeconomic perspective, the kind of question you want to ask yourself is, what is the better architecture to efficiently provide liquidity to the real economy? Do you want to have a single tier system in which firms, consumers basically use means of payment issued by the government? Or do you want to have the current system, the two tier system, which comes with fractional reserve banking and all the kinds of issues that we know of? Now, if you make statements like these, the, the next question you typically get is, well, we have the current system for good reasons because we want banks to disintermediate and that takes the fractional reserve banking. So is it really that we should, um, for that reason, not think about CBDC? Should we fear bank disintermediation as a consequence of retail CBDC? And I think the answer is no. You should be a bit more nuanced in that respect because we are not talking about disintermediating banks, we are potentially talking about reducing money creation by banks. That's not the same thing. You know, these days, these two issues are very much uh, related to each other, connected to each other. But in principle, you can think about liquidity provision on the one hand and intermediation between savers and investors on the other hand as two different objectives. Narrow banks is one way to think about that very clearly, right? So one does not necessarily have to come with the other. Should we therefore fear bank disintermediation? And the answer is, if you take a purely macroeconomic perspective, no, you don't have to. Because in principle, and um, there's papers out there which make this formally very precise and clear, you can completely insulate the banking sector and therefore also the real economy that depends on loans extended by banks. You can completely insulate those guys from who is actually providing liquidity to the real economy. These two things can be insulated. They're orthogonal conceptually to each other. On the other hand, you should worry about that, not for macroeconomic reasons, but for political reasons, because a world with CBDC that is actually adopted is a world with very long balance sheets of central banks, because the money multiplier that we currently have in the commercial banking sector would be reduced to one if CBDC is fully adopted, and therefore the balance sheet of the central banks would be very, very long. 
And that is a world that I personally, from a political economy perspective, would feel a bit uncomfortable about because there is, as you know, lots of political pressure. There would be even more fiscal um, pressure on the central bank, maybe also more financial pressure on the central bank, but certainly more pressure on the central bank and also more space for serious mistakes being done by central banks. Let me say uh, for my remaining two or three minutes that I have, I think uh, a few words about the digital euro, which is just one example next to the digital pound, of course, of what people are thinking about these days in the retail CBDC sphere. The European Central Bank is very much concerned about this here. For that reason, when they're thinking and when they're pushing the idea of a digital euro, they make very, very clear that they cannot think really about a digital euro which has um, exposure by the private sector more than three or 4,000 euros. So the idea is to have a, a cap on digital euro holdings of, say, 3,000 euros. Um, if you hear that, you wonder yourself, um, number one, is it necessary? If you believe in this neutrality result I discussed before, maybe it's not even necessary to have that. Number two, will anybody bother? You know, If you trust in deposit insurance and you get some in interest on your deposits, would you actually really want to hold 3,000 digital euro max without interest just to have them? I mean, why would you? And what does this actually deliver for firms? Coming back to my, pre to my first slide, I think it was, you know, Firms are not really on the radar of the ECB these days. It's, it's, it's small transaction by retail customers which are on the radar, but not business needs like Logistics 4.0, for example. Do European banks fear the digital euro, given that there is this fear of disintermediation floating around? And the answer at this point is a clear no. What this figure is supposed to show you, and I'm sorry that you probably cannot read it, is how share prices of banks uh, responded to announcement about the digital euro. You see two vertical lines here, and you see a bunch of sort of horizontal lines. Basically, the message is, when the news of the digital euro first came out, this is like October 20 or something, there was quite some response in bank shares. They went down. And actually, they went down most for those banks who very much rely on deposit funding, and much less so for banks which are less reliant on deposit funding. That makes sense, fits into the picture. Then over time, and the next vertical line is around February 21, the ECB became clearer and clearer about these caps, these 3,000 euro cap on you know, digital euro exposure. And at that point, you see that the bank share prices, to the extent that this empirical exercise by Frank Smets and co-authors is valid, they converge back to each other, and there's basically not much of an effect left anymore. So banks basically don't care at this point. Let me conclude with a big picture from a macroeconomist. Um, number one, I think when we think about retail CBDC, as we heard before, this is not a story about technology. The big game changer here, at least from an economic point of view, is what kind of monetary architecture are we talking about? Are we moving to a single tier monetary architecture? Many people, including many central banks, are very much concerned about the risks of that these days. You shouldn't lose sight of the potential benefits. I quote here Andy Haldane. That's something that he said on his last day in office at the Bank of England. So when he dared, I guess, to point out that this radically different topology coming with a single-tier system, while not costless, would reduce its source to fragilities in the banking model that have been causing financial crisis for over 800 years. So that's something we should keep in mind, and I think this is first order to keep in mind. The second point I'd, leave you, I'd like to leave you with from a macro point of view is that these are questions that are not questions for central banks to answer, although many central banks take that view. These questions very, very far exceed the realm and the responsibilities of central banks, which are entrusted with monetary stability, financial stability, payments, this is much bigger issues. This is national sovereignty, taxation, seniorage, competition, many, many other things. So in the end, this is a discussion that we should lead at the level of parliaments, governments, societies, but not only within central banks. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nick Kerrigan, uh, Managing Director and Head of Innovation uh, at SWIFT and uh, I, I do what my uh, role describes, uh, innovation and that means we sort of roll up our sleeves and get our, our, our hands dirty in, in trying, uh, trying new things and so therefore I hope these comments will be a really nice complement to the, the academic perspective that we've, uh, we've heard uh, so far uh, in the session today. So why should we be caring about CBDCs. I think the reason we should be caring about CBDCs is we see a really growing momentum globally in this trend. Uh, you can see some of the stats up here on the, on the, on the slide. So uh, we, we follow closely the, uh, the, the tracker that's done by the Atlantic Council. And what that tells us is that over 100 countries are now exploring a CBDC. Indeed, I think it says on here, 11 countries have now actually launched uh, a digital, uh, a digital current, tr currency, and those are countries as diverse as the Bahamas and Nigeria. And I think one of the stats that I found very interesting was a survey done at the end of last year by OMFIF, and OMFIF is like a kind of industry association that promotes dialogue uh, amongst central banks. And OMFIF surveyed central banks, and 24% of the central banks that they talk to said that they plan to issue a CBDC in the next one to two years, which means that by, say, the end of 2024, we could see 20 or so CBDCs in circulation globally. Now, as a SWIFT, we do not take a policy view on CBDCs, and we're not going to get into that conversation because actually, as Dirk rightly said, um, this is a conversation for governments and their central banks to take a view on whether they want to introduce a CBDC or not. But I think, as, as these I think, stats suggest, that um, this is a trend that is growing in momentum, and this is a trend that is really starting to happen now. And given that, it's incumbent on the financial community to look at the opportunities and challenges that CBDCs uh, can present. And so that's what we've been doing for some time. So some of the key observations that we've, we've seen, and we've seen over the research that, that SWIFT has been doing over the last several years, they continue to hold true, and they continue actually to be, I think, important guidance into how we think about CBDCs working. The first, I think, thing to say on this is that CBDCs are going to be a very diverse group because actually different countries and different central banks are looking to solve quite different things with, with us, the introduction of CBDC. So, for example, if you look at, uh, say, what has happened in terms of the, the Bahamas sand dollar or the Nigerian e Naira, I think these countries are primarily looking at how they can accelerate the digitization of their own economies and therefore, uh, therefore economic growth. If you look at countries that are already highly digital, such as the, the UK, the, the Eurozone or, or the US, I think different motivations are, are at work. And those motivations are about uh, the, the evolution of things like uh, the use of central bank money. Because as we have heard uh, already today, as money digitizes, then cash which is a central bank money, is then increasingly replaced by the current forms of electronic money, which are currently all uh, private sector to money. So you could see the motivation as a central bank to want to kind of continue to have balance in that, the monetary forms across uh, your economy, even if that economy is fully digital. So I think we'll see a very diverse set of CBDCs uh, emerging, and I think they will also be supported by a diverse set of technology uh, platforms. When people talk about CBDCs, often people associate those automatically with DLT and blockchain technology. Actually, if you look at the work that has gone on across the world, you actually see different technology architectures being, uh, being worked on. So, for example, China's eCNY domestically is based on a centralized architecture. Project Hamilton, which is an important piece of work done by MIT and the Boston Fed in the U.S., evaluated different architectures, so DLT alongside centralized architectures, and came out in favor of a more conventional centralized one. Similarly, if you even think about DLT or blockchain itself, we use one word, but this is actually has considerable variation within it. 
So you have public blockchains, you have private and permission blockchains, and in even within private and permission blockchains, such as uh, Corda or Quorum or Hyperledger Fabric, there are important differences. Um, and so a diverse set of CBDCs emerging, supported by a diverse set of technologies. And so the challenge we've set ourselves at SWIFT in this context is to try and make this all work together. In other words, to make this diverse set of CBDCs work together with themselves and alongside existing payment systems, which will undoubtedly continue to exist for many, many years to come. And how do you actually join that up so that if I'm Nick in the UK and I have a digital pound, I can actually pay Dirk, who's maybe in the Eurozone and doesn't have a digital euro, right? How do you actually make that work? So we address this in a, in a few ways, and I won't get to the detail of this slide, but I think the key thing to take away here is we need to create interoperability. Interoperability between these different forms of money and interoperability between the different technologies that support them. We work on this in, a, in, a, in three different ways. One is to get involved in industry initiatives, uh, such as something called the Regulated Liabilities Network, or RLN, that you may have seen literature about. The second is that we join with the BIS and key central banks to experiment where they value our, our presence. And the third is that we initiate our own sets of experimentation to try and drive forward the collective knowledge of the industry. And last year, we uh, demonstrated a new experimental solution to be able to do what we call interlink CBDC networks. So on this diagram, you see different, two different CBDC networks and a conventional payment system linked together at a technical uh, level. This solution, we believe, is potentially powerful because uh, it can allow a high level of automation and straight through processing of a payment, but also it is highly scalable because through connecting once to SWIFT's platform, that would enable uh, the, that domestic CBDC to be used for cross-border payments with, uh, with any other uh, payment system that's already uh, connected to SWIFT. This, if you're familiar with the literature, is a demonstration of what the BIS calls the MCBDC Model 2, or interlinking model. And in that sense, is, is kind of a hub-and-spoke uh, similar architecturally to uh, the BIS's recent project, um, Icebreaker. So we realized in, in designing this solution that we made a lot of assumptions. Um, and those assumptions need to be tested in an evolving area, such as CBDCs. So what we did in the fourth quarter of last year is we took that, the whole infrastructure that supported the solution I've just showed you and we put it into a sandbox environment. And then we invited 18 central and commercial banks to join us in that sandbox, so names that you might have heard of like the Banque de France, the Deutsche Bundesbank, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, together with global commercial banks such as HSBC. And we worked with those participants over an intense 12-week period First, for them to experiment with us individually, and second, for them to be able to gather together every two weeks to share knowledge and discuss key design issues about CBDCs. And I think that was incredibly important to actually leverage the knowledge that has been developed across the globe so that people don't have to start with a blank sheet of paper each time. We need to build the collective knowledge of the, of the financial industry through collaborative innovation. The result of this was um, that the participants saw clear potential in value in the solution we developed. They encouraged us to go forward and they said they'd like to be with us on that journey. You can read uh, lots more about this in much more detail should you have the desire to do so by either scanning the QR code or going to the link, uh, the link above and to read the results report we published about this on the 9th of March. So, we're going for further in this, and um, we're now at an exciting stage of development. We have uh, taken the experimental solution I've designed, and we've now built that into a beta version that we are getting ready to test with selected central banks uh, in the next uh, couple of months or so. And alongside that, we intend to uh, run a second phase of our CBDC sandbox, expanding the use cases we've covered from payments transfers and payment versus payment into new, uh, new use cases and finding new forms of utility. And we'll intend to do that later in Q2. So in conclusion, I think it's fair to say none of us has a crystal ball about which way the world is going. Certainly I don't, and if, probably if I did, I would be sat on a beach, not 
talk, doing payments uh, for a full-time job. Um, but I think it is incumbent on all of us to respond to the growing momentum we see in CBDCs and to figure out how payments can be made seamlessly by consumers and businesses with this new form of digital money. Thank you. Hello, I'm delighted to join you all. Let's flick on to a, there we go. Um, uh, and to share a panel with, um, such, with such experience and knowledge today. Um, as Jana says, I lead the BIS's Innovation Hub London Centre. And before I jump in over the next 10 minutes or so, I might steal a few minutes if that's possible, um, I just and provide you with an overview of the work that's going on across the central banking community. And Nick has given a really good starting point to that. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, and set the scene about the role of the Biz Innovation Hub um, and the work that we seek to do. So the Biz Innovation Hub was set up a little over three years ago. Um, and it's part of the Bank for International Settlements, so some of you might know that as the central bank for central banks. And it has a mandate to do three things. We seek to identify and develop in-depth insights into critical trends in emerging technology that is relevant to central banks. We want to serve as a focal point for a network of central bank experts in innovation, and as Nick said so, so well, in a space of huge change and huge momentum, convening and bringing together people to share insight, share thoughts, share what's working, what's not working, is incredibly important and ever more so. And finally, and perhaps of most importance for our conversation today, is that we explore the development of public goods in enhancing the functioning of the global financial system. What on earth does that mean in practice? It means that we experiment with technology, and that's what I want to talk to you about in the second half of my presentation today. We experiment in the form of proof of concepts and prototypes to seek to understand and inform the potential value that they can bring. We've talked a lot already this morning about the pace of change, and we've talked a lot about the experimentation that's going on. And what I want to do in the first half of my presentation is talk to you in a little bit more detail about what we see that experimentation actually look like. So in the second half of my remarks, I'll share a little bit more about the projects. Nick's already touched on a few of them in the hub. But, but perhaps before I do, I will touch on uh, and give you an overview of the breadth and pace of activity that we're seeing from central banks. So... <clears throat> We know, let's take it as a given, that central banks around the world have been researching uh, CBDCs for several years now. And we generally categorise this work in two ways. Either retail and or wholesale focused, and according to its relative stage of maturity. So from pure research through to pilot um, and ultimately into production. And as we've already heard, as of the start of this year, we think there are four production retail CBDCs in the world, in the Bahamas, in the Eastern Caribbean, Nigeria, and Jamaica. And there are at least 34 pilot projects covering both wholesale and retail CBDC. And as we also know, since 2016, there has been a general and continuing upward trend in the focus of this research and this experimentation. So 90% of central banks that we surveyed were engaged in CBDC analysis or in projects in 2021, up from two-thirds in 2017. Over the same period, the number of pilot projects has doubled, reaching 26% of survey respondents. And in parallel, a growing number of central bank governors and board members have been making public speeches about CBDC. So what are the motivations behind the CBDC work? We've heard some of them already, but I want to kind of delve into those in a little bit more detail. Starting with retail CBDC, we see that the drivers really differ by country. When we looked at advanced economies, we found the improving, that improving payments efficiency, payment safety, and improving financial stability were their top motivations. Last year, financial stability has really grown in importance for the advanced economies. For emerging market economies, we found that payment efficiency and, pay, uh, and safety play an important role, but financial inclusion, as we've heard already, really is the primary reason for exploring CBDC. But let me also highlight one other thing. 
Over the past few years, cross-border payments efficiency has become a more important motivation for emerging market economies, whereas it appears to have declined somewhat in importance for advanced economies. Turning now to wholesale CBDC. Cross-border payment efficiency has overtaken domestic payment efficiency for the, being the key reason why central banks are looking into CBDC. But financial stability, monetary policy implementation, and safety and resiliency also feature prominently. On cross-border payments efficiency, we asked central banks to elaborate on the frictions a CBC, CBDC might address. And for both advanced economies and emerging economy, economies, limit, limiting operating hours for payment systems and long transaction chains stood out as key opportunities. So, <clears throat> an overview of our Biz Innovation Hub projects. Our CBDC project, so the Biz Innovation Hub, works across six domains since its inception three years ago. CBDCs, next-gen FMIs, subtech reg tech, green finance, open finance, uh, and cyber. And for any of you who have followed our work closely, A, you'll probably wonder how on earth we come up with the project names for our projects. But you might also have noticed, it's very clear, it stands out very clearly, that over 50% of our project portfolio is in CBDCs. And that spans wholesale and it spans retail and cross-border use cases. And we talked about um, a Project Icebreaker that was published out of the Nordic Centre just a little while ago. So <clears throat> this here is an overview. And you can see we have some wonderful names coming through on our, on our, for our projects. But on domestic wholesale CBDC, Helvetia um, is a, one of our key examples at the top there. The hub has learned that it's possible to integrate CBDCs into existing core banking systems and that central banks can play a key role in systems based on DLT, as we just heard. On retail CBDC, biz experiments are at a different stage in the innovation process. And what I would say is when the innovation hub was set up and work on uh, CBDCs commenced, they were predominantly in the wholesale space. It's really been in the last year with Project Roslyn from the London Centre, Aurum and others, that we're starting to see a move into the retail space. Some of our, <clears throat> our projects on retail CBDC have focused on technology architecture of a two-tier distribution model, Project Aurum, for example, or on the, re on the distribution of a retail CBDC through an open API, API system, a project very close to my heart, Project Roslyn in London, but there are also ongoing projects exploring cybersecurity, Polaris, Seller, resilience, privacy, and as all of the features of a CBDC architecture. And what I would observe is that these, this really speaks to the, the complexity, the breadth and the depth of some of the design decisions that are at play when thinking about um, the CBDC space. More recently, on cross-border payments, our experiments have li are linked very much to the G20 roadmap to improve, improve cross-border payments, uh, how wholesale can, and retail cross-border payments can deliver faster, cheaper, and more transparent payments. So that's Jura, Dunbar, Enbridge, and recent work again on Icebreaker. But more recently, as we start to find our feet in this space and build up a corpus of work, we've also started exploring how the programmable nature of blockchain technology can be applied to multi-currency CBDC platforms through the implementation of automated market-making algorithms for foreign exchange trades. I had to read that out. I'm not going to lie. That's quite complex. Um, and our recent project from the Swiss Centre, Mariana, is a really good example. So <clears throat> as these projects mature, we've also started to consolidate learnings to help connect the dots. And I think this is really important. One of my reflections, for standing from the outs I take an outside-in perspective, is we have a portfolio now of nearly 30 projects. As I said, about half are in the CBDC space. And there is a huge amount of richness and learning coming out. Some of those projects are taking uh, different perspectives on a similar challenge. Others are coming at it in a completely new and different way. But our, our ability to, kind of, to consolidate that corpus of knowledge and insight and share that back is becoming increasingly important. And the first example of this was a paper we published last summer on our lessons uh, learnt on using CBDCs across borders. And these are the experience, experiments in Thunan Lion Rock in our Hong Kong centre, Jura in our Swiss centre, and Dunbar in our Singapore centre. 
Each project involved a multitude of private sector partners from technology providers, banks and consultancy firms. And I want to answer a couple of questions around how are the solutions designed similar, how are the solutions different, and what are the key insights? And I think that piece about um, working with the private sector uh, and across the private sector is really important. One of the core features of, um, of the work in the Innovation Hub, one of the core tenets and characteristics, is around collaboration. We recognise very much that the, within the central banking community, um, we need to work in partnership with others to really draw in that insight, draw in that expertise. And so working with partnership with academia, with the private sector, to really um, experiment to understand is really, really key. So two important features of any cross-border or currency system are both the access platform design and the access rules. And many cross-border systems have started out by interlinking existing platforms. One ex example is the original target system, which interlinked the national RTGS systems in the Eurozone, but moved to a common platform with target two. In both in, with, with the original Fedwire as well, that interlinked the different the Federal Reserve Banks by at least telegraph lines. And in both cases, each central reserve bank maintained their own software and data processing centres. But over time, this proved to be too inefficient, and the systems moved to a common platform. Nexus is another example from the, Hong, from the Singapore centre. It seeks to interlink payment systems around the world. On access, most existing RTGS systems do not allow non-resident financial institutions to have access. And one exception that makes the rule is the Swiss uh, SIC RTGS system. Basically, an eligible bank in London can send and receive payments directly in SIC without the need for a branch or subsidiary in Switzerland. And interestingly, all four of the cross-border CBDC projects from the Innovation Hub chose a common platform and access for non-resident financial institutions. I'm going to run quickly through some of the key features of the respective design solutions. But what I will talk about is, you know, Jura uh, and uh, Dunbar are all prototypes where Infinite and Lyra Rock was a proof of concept, Embridge is a pilot. The exact boundaries when we talk about pilots and proof of concepts are a little bit fluid, but a POC broadly shows if something can be de developed, whereas we think of a prototype showing how something can be developed. <clears throat> In thinking about the different, how the different experiments differ, um, whilst all, um, uh, all projects went with a common platform, Jura added a subnetwork which allowed central bank nodes to reside in their own jurisdiction, and the choice of, different, of distributed ledger technology differed across each of the projects. Non-financial resident institutions could request, redeem and hold CBDC in all projects, and a direct access model was tested. In Jura, the operator is private. In all other projects, the operator is one or more central bank. So what have been some of the key insights that we have built out from our work on CBDC experimentation? In our view, the sweet spot for any innovation is the intersection between desirability, feasibility and viability. On the first point, desirability, the potential public value of, common C of a common CBDC platform with access for non-resident financial institutions relates to more co efficient cross-border payments, PBP for non-CLS currencies and cross-border security systems. On feasibility, all of the projects all demonstrate a level of technical feasibility, although it must be noted that these are proof-of-concept initiatives that are far, far, far away from production-grade systems. However, there are still outstanding issues such as scalability and performance, resilience and security, as well as data protection and location. And an outstanding question is whether a cross-border CBDC platform is viable. So, <clears throat> if I can just spend a moment before I hand back to Jana, talking a little bit about some work we've been doing in the London Centre on Project Rosalind. So, Project Rosalind is a retail CBDC project. And essentially, it is about building a set of API prototypes to distribute a retail CBDC. It's based on a two-tier distribution model where the central bank is at the foundation of the retail CBDC. The system and customer-facing activities are carried out by the private sector. And again, this was a really core part of our work. 
in building out Project Rosalind. I've talked about collaboration, I've talked about that importance of experimentation with a broad range of stakeholders, and this was really key in the work we did across Project Rosalind, the findings of which, which will be published hopefully uh, uh, early summer. So in both phases of the work, we uh, engaged with uh, a range of API users and advisors to do two things to help us test the functionality, to help us with think through adoption, to help us think about ecosystem building and the breadth of innovation. And that was really key for us because it was about um, opening up a broader suite of engagements so that, for example, with the advisors group, we could test core elements of the functionality that we were seeking to build. We could ask key questions around um, how we were building out that, that, about, out that architecture. And with our API users, we were, we were building out sort of the key functionality as we went along. And as we developed our project Rosalind and developed out those API prototypes, we opened that further to a broader set of ecosystem participants to really understand and think about and surface the breadth of use cases that could come and be located within a retail CBDC architecture. So I hope I've given you an overview of the range and breadth of work that we're doing in the Innovation Hub and a bit more detail on the work that we're doing in the London Centre, focused on the retail CBDC side. Jonna. Thank you. So, thank you all for those fascinating presentations and for setting the scene in terms of where we are with some of the CBDC work that's ongoing today. And you've all discussed a, a number of interesting projects, you know, ranging from progress on the digital euro to SWIFT's work um, and the many experiments that the BIS is collaborating with central banks on. But at the end of the day, there's a lot going on in the CBDC world. There's a lot of talk about the benefits that they can bring. But where are we in terms of adoption? Um, so, Nick, you, your slide mentioned 11 um, live CBDCs. I cannot name all of them, to be quite honest. I'm guessing there are some pilots in there as well. We all know, you know one of the biggest pilots at the moment is obviously China's um, ECNY, um, which is on a scale that in most other jurisdictions would just be considered live at this point in time. Um, but in other jurisdictions, such as the Bahamas with respect to the sand dollar and Nigeria with respect to the e-Naira, um, adoption hasn't been great, really. So let's explore, perhaps, um, in the first part of this panel, some of the barriers to adoption and how they can be overcome. Um, Nick, when we talked about this earlier on, you mentioned that some of this may just be perceptions around barriers to adoption rather than actual challenges with adoption themselves. Could you start off by talking us through that? Yes, so thanks, Jenna. I, um, thank you for giving me the privilege of going first on this. I mean, so, so I think when I think about adoption here, I think about, um, about has a whatever product it is that you're trying to achieve, has it achieved? what we might call product market fit, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of then d discussion at the moment about, okay, well, say the e naira or the sand dollar is not being highly used by, by consumers, and therefore there's then a, a logical link that people have made to those are, are not working or they're not achieving their, their purpose. I suppose what I, I would say is I, I kind of, um, I, th I think we have to view that work in the context of what they're trying to achieve and also what it brings for us more broadly as a global community in understanding CBDCs. Because at the other perspective I would offer is that actually in some ways those central banks that have, that have gone first and gone live have been very brave because they've actually gone live with something where they're still in the, per in the process of identifying what the things that will actually drive adoption will really, will really be. Um, and, you know, that... The, you know, that, that stands in contrast with many other central banks that, that have, uh, as has been described here, adopted a much more, a much more staged approach. So I, I would offer that I think it's, very, it's rather early to sort of claim judgment on something like the INRA or the sand dollar because, or indeed the ECNY in China, because those actual countries, by doing what they're doing, are actually going to be learning very rapidly what works and what doesn't, and therefore can iterate and innovate in a cycle 
that actually in some ways could, can, could allow them to, to gain kind of, you know, what might be called a kind of first mover, mover advantage. So uh, I, 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 I think they will actually be doing their experimentation in the wild, if you like, or in the, in the live. That doesn't mean I'm advocating that there's a, there's a better or worse approach. And as I said, we don't take a policy view on this. But I think we should also recognize that those who've, those who've gone early, as, as is seen in many kind of different types of innovation, uh, you know, you, you learn things that allows you to adopt, to adapt your product and iterate it, um, and therefore, um, you know, discover really what the sort of, what the, you know, the necessary key features are. Thanks, Nick. And I think you, you touched on a few interesting points there. Um, one being, you know, that kind of first mover advantage that comes. And secondly, it's, it's almost a bit like, you know, initially at least build it and see if they will come. Um, and in this case, the they is the private sector, really, because in most of these examples, what central banks are actually building in terms of a retail CBDC is some sort of platform that will be used by the private sector for innovation. And... Um, you know, Dirk, you had some thoughts on this kind of chicken and egg situation about which comes first. Is it the private sector innovation or is it the public innovation? How do they reinforce each other and feed off each other? Yeah, yeah thanks, Jenna. So, so I guess what we see in the U.S., for example, right now is that uh, from the Fed side, there would be complaints about uh, the U.S. banking sector lagging behind in terms of you know, quality that they offer to retail users. But then on the other hand, if, you're, if you place yourself in the, in the, in the seats of, of the bankers, they would probably fear that the CBDC is coming out in the next few years. So should they really engage in major innovations at this point, or should they better wait and see how the, how the game develops? So there's a little bit of a, a strategic you know, wait and see aspect from both sides, which might be lagged through the process of adoption. And the second point that I would like to, to shortly raise here is if you really um, take that view that I was trying to push before, that there's not that much maybe uh, in for users here on the retail CBDC side. Right? And of course, you get a safe claim vis-a-vis -vis the central bank. That's great. Mm -hmm. But if you trust in, in deposit insurance, right, you have these things already today, so you might not trust. But if you do trust, then there's not much of a reason really for retail users to adopt CBDC, unless they were to pay interest, which they typically probably don't in this, in this uh, what we see right now in plans. So uh, in the end, if, if as society we feel that there is a, a use case here, or there's a good case to introduce them, then we have to probably find other incentives to convince people to adopt them, rather than to just wait and hope that users will find it in their interest to adopt them. Okay. Thank you. And Francesca, how, from your viewpoint, how can private and public sector collaboration help to overcome some of these, these barriers to adoption or to create the use cases that will facilitate greater adoption? So I, mean, I think um, <clears throat> looking at the work that we have been doing on Rosalind, that private and public sector collaboration has been at the heart. And it's been at the heart in a couple of ways. So it's been at the heart in terms of Helping to helping to build out that, that functionality and helping to really leverage the experience of you know, of of different sectors and different uh, specialisms uh, globally actually to really bring that to bear and I think that's a, that's that's been incredibly powerful. But then I think there was a there was a kind of a recognition, uh, particularly when we were thinking about the kind of fourth objective of the objectives of Rosalind around innovation, which was, you know, we didn't know the bounds of it. Uh, we didn't we didn't know kind of the art of the possible in that sense and so therefore taking a very um deliberate uh view to open up rosalind to engage with pr the public and the private sectors and i say you know say that really deliberately kind of academia as well as uh, uh, as the private sector to, to surface the breadth of, of, what that, of what the realm of those use cases could look like. And it has been sort of use cases, and that's been what's been really fascinating. Um, and, you know, that's not come without its, you know, challenges. You know, thinking about the right guardrails that you put in place to support that collaboration and that innovation, you know, particularly, you know, in, a, in an environment which may not be used you know, from a BIS point of view, used to innovation in this way, thinking about how you do that constructively and, 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 and in a way that kind of um, puts, as I said, the right, the, the right guardrails in place. 
But I think what we have seen is, you know, partly to your point, Dirk, you know, we've, we've, we've had conversation when we've showcased the use cases and some have said, you can do that already. But we've also seen some use cases where actually you can't necessarily do that already. And it is starting to speak to a breadth and a diversity, um, you know, whether that's addressing current pain points, whether that's integration, and you talked about interoperability, whether that's new ways of making payments, whether that's things like digital inclusion. You know, there's, we, we are starting to see, and, you know, I, I don't want to quite sort of um, give, give, put the cat out of the bag before the report's out in, in a couple of months' time, but um, we're starting to see a, a, real, a real breadth, and I think um, that has been predicated on a really careful and intentional way of, of shaping that conversation and that experimentation with both the public and the private sectors. And I think when we're talking about adoption, we're really getting to the point as well that people start asking which is, well, if there are challenges to adoption, then doesn't just, this just go, go back to the original question of why CBDC? Why do we need CBDCs in the first place? And you, you've all pointed out to some extent the, that different jurisdictions have different policy drivers for introducing CBDCs. The most obvious ones have been the earliest to market. So, for example, in the Bahamas and Nigeria, it's been about essentially leapfrogging layers of, you know, payments, um, technology innovation, um, and, and also financial inclusion drivers as well. But in jurisdictions where we've already got fairly sophisticated payments infrastructure that's well-functioning, there's arguably a need to kind of dig a bit deeper in, in looking at the why CBDC question. Um, so open question to, to all of you. Um, what are the different drivers for jurisdictions to introduce CBDCs, particularly when we're putting payments, modernization of payments infrastructure and financial inclusion to one side? What are the kind of wider policy drivers? And how do these policy drivers influence potentially design decisions as well? So I pick on someone over Go off, Jenny. We volunteer. Okay. Um, so, Dirk. Um, policy decisions. You've touched on the digital, the digital euro, which has a fairly, I'd say the, the eurozone has a more explicit political driver, doesn't it, in introducing a digital euro as a potential force for greater in integration? Um, I think there's, there's a movement uh, along you know, what exactly the objective is, as far as I can read that as an outsider. Let me say one thing about the digital or the financial inclusion thing, which is something I'm, I, I'm not sure I fully understand this argument. I mean, many countries who raise that as a potential motivation would be countries that currently have uh, a major share of the population not served by the financial sector, obviously. So if you ask yourself why, then these are often constituencies that, that suffer from financial repression. So, you know, if you're in a country and you cannot really access the financial system, um, and now the country introduces CBDC and maybe those people can access the financial system, then there's a lot of drawbacks for the government in place actually in those countries because they currently benefit from the fact that you know, there's, there's uh, major spreads that people don't have the opportunity to, um, uh, to move capital abroad, for example, these kind of issues. So would these countries really have an incentive, honestly, to you know, relax constraints on their population, giving them access to the financial sector? Or are they currently rather um, uh, you know, worried that if somebody else abroad would do that, that their population would get access to the digital dollar, for example, and then you know, be uh, unconstrained by these domestic restrictions on, on financial access and, and capital movements? So I'm not really sure. Um, if, you, if you ask yourself, for example, look at the U.S., a major share of the U.S. population does not have a bank account, but these people do not have a bank account because they wouldn't be able to, but they, trust, they don't trust banks. They don't like banks, essentially. Right? That's why they don't have it. So I'm not sure that the financial inclusion is a major driver. I don't think I have really answered your question, but probably that's the best I can do. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, let, let's turn to, to more of the wholesale arguments there, because it's, it's often said, at least by the banking sector, that the, the case for wholesale CBDC is clearer, um, although 
there's a separate debate to be had around that. Um, but Nick, I think you've done a great deal of work in identifying the potential benefits to FX and liquidity and things like that that can arise from introduction of CBDC. Yeah, thanks. And um, maybe just, sorry, I'm going to slightly sort of do a circle here because I will, I will um, for just addressing maybe following on from Dirk's point about financial inclusion, what, one thing I think that, that is worth actually highlighting here is a very interesting piece that was done by a um, uh, joint research project by MIT um, with a professor called Lana Schwartz. Um, who actually, went, they went out and did primary research, I think it was in India actually, they went out and actually asked people, like, what would, what would, what would be a CBDC be useful for you, and what would it, what would it take? And I think that was a, that's a, that's a large academic piece, but I think it's well worth, uh, well worth reading, and um, uh, Lana's done some very interesting work on, uh, in, on new money, and she actually came on our, our series of LinkedIn Live shows uh, in January, uh, which is sort of, I suppose, a bite-sized kind of a distillation of that. To your point about the question about wholesale, right? So, um, um, and slightly, I'm afraid, contrary to the typology maybe that, 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 that Francesca outlined, I, I think there's, there's a, a challenge here in, in the some, sometimes limited scope of, of, of kind of discourse around, around CBDCs because often we talk retail and wholesale but we mean those use those words in a different way that's often is, is used in the, the, those words are used in what i might call conventional banking terms in other words people talk about wholesale and they typically in cbdc world mean interbank settlement and then they talk about retail and they typically mean person to person consumer payments um but as all the payment specialists in this room will know there's a vast spectrum of payments that exist, uh, you know, within those two or between those two sort of sort of uh, dichotomies. And Dirk highlighted it earlier with, with you know, how, what could it do for firms, right? So what could CBDC actually do for business to business payments, uh, and also the complexities of those the, those payments that might be business to business to consumer, for example. Uh, and so forth, uh, so forth with, with, within within those. I think in the as you look towards more of that corporate and wholesale space, pe people are always looking f uh, for uh, things like predictability, speed, and, and efficiency. And I think that's where the, the you know the curiosity comes in about how could CBDCs uh, do that. I think Francesca, you had on your slide the possibility you know of of improved FX settlement for non CLS currencies that were. That's certainly one of the things that we heard when we did the CBDC sandbox that I mentioned in my, my comments. So I think there is, uh, there is uh, potential benefits that the community should be looking at around, around FX and around uh, liquidity um, in, in particular. And certainly that's, going to for, that's likely to form parts of the exploration that I mentioned about with our phase two of the sandbox with new use cases there. I think there's real interest from the financial community in going and going deeper on some of those things, building on some of the important work that's been done already. Thanks, Mike. Francesca, anything to add on some of those use cases that you're exploring that, and you know, possible, possible incentives that they might be creating for central banks to explore flip further the introduction of wholesale CBDCs, such as, um, you know, Project Helvetia, for example, and the, um, the, the cross-border digital security settlement use case, things like that. I mean, I think what we, um, I'm not a wholesale sector, CBDC expert, and they very much sit with my colleagues in the Swiss Centre, but I mean, what I would say is that we are, you know, we are seeing a, a, sh a shift, if you look at the range of experiments on wholesale across the hub, they, have, they are now sort of shifting into a more future-looking state, so they have very much experimented um, around sort of the, the cross-border piece, it, but now they're moving into a space of um, what is more experimental, more about kind of sort of uh, uh, automated market making, for example. Um, and so I would see actually, I would, thinking about the work that they're doing, I would expect to see more deepening of practice in, in those kind of areas. Okay. And let's, let's talk about some of the, the retail work then, because I think actually, you know, from my perspective, um, we see less in public about the BIS's retail work, actually. Like some of those experiments that you mentioned um, on your slides, um, I hadn't even heard of some of them <laughs> in, in terms of, you know, cybersecurity angles and, um, you know, improved payments and things like that. 
Um, what sort of central banks are you working with and engaging with on these kind of projects, mm. and what kind of <coughs> positive outcomes are they showing? So I think so. There's part of the reason why. So the, the innovation hub has gone through a wave of expansion. So uh, in really quite short order. So in the first. Uh, the, the Innovation Hub has been around for just over three years. The first three centres were in Switzerland, Hong Kong and Singapore. And then within a relatively short time frame, you had an expansion to four more centres. London, the Nordics at the Riksbank, the Eurosystem, which opened um, a few uh, last month, um, and then the, uh, in Toronto, which will be coming uh, later this year with a strategic partnership with the New York Fed. Um, so part of it has been about those centres building out their project portfolios and actually sort of being a bit heads down in terms of doing the work. Rosalind, I think, is maybe a little bit different because we took a very um, deliberate approach to kind of draw back the curtain as we were going along, if you like, to kind of show our, our workings out and our experimentation. You know, within those guardrails, as I suggested, we didn't sort of, you know, completely take off. Um, yeah, we're unfettered in that respect. So there's a, there's a degree to which... My colleagues in the centres, you know, whether it's on Icebreaker or on others, are kind of heads down, doing the work, doing the, doing the delivery. Um, in terms of who they work with, um, we all are hosted by a central bank. Um, so typically the kind of principal kind of uh, co-creator uh, or, or collaborator is, is with the host central bank. So you'll see that with, uh, in, in, with Project Icebreaker, for example, it's with the Nordics, but it's also with the Bank of Israel, um, and I'm trying to remember who the other central bank involved in that one was. It'll come to me. It's in Norway. It might have, yes. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, so there is a kind of, there is a, across the kind of uh, BIS kind of community, um, and it depends on the project. You know, cross-border projects are, you know, by, the, by their nature, <laughs> you're going to want to kind of have different, different central banks involved to really, to, to really draw that through. Other banks, uh, other projects are much more kind of um, binary in, in, in that respect. Um, but um, and I think, as I said, it speaks to the, the different complexions of the different projects. Um, but I think also what you're sort of seeing now with the retail CBDC experimentation is the different complexions on, uh, on, on thinking about you know, what are the different questions you need to ask, what are the de different design questions around, uh, around security, around privacy, uh, you know, all of these different elements. And I think as we are starting to scale, um, as we are starting to learn lessons from other projects as well, really thinking about, well, what are the, what are the, kind of the, the, the insights that we have kind of maybe can bank and what are the insights that actually we need to really go, go further on or deeper on or, or break new ground on? Okay. I'm Joe, just, any questions I am going to, in one more question's time, I was just about to say, um, I'm, I'm conscious of time and just going to ask the panel one open question, which may be a little bit controversial, and just set the scene for, for um, Q&A. And if we need to, we can go maybe a couple of minutes into the coffee break, but I don't want to take too much out of your coffee break because it's been a long session. Um, as I said at the beginning, CBDCs and new forms of digital money give us an opportunity to kind of rip up our preconceptions of what money and payments should look like and look at the requirements of today and the future in terms of money and payments and the technology we have today and see what we can do. And this could potentially, you know, one of the key changes here is in terms of the market structures and payment market infrastructures that we have today, um, which may be intermediated to various extents um, for reasons that are historical and legacy and the introduction of CBDCs could, um, could lead to opportunities for some, um, you know, changes in this level of intermediation. Um, so to what extent do you all foresee CBDCs as having the potential to introduce potentially radical change to payment and financial market structures? <laughs> I know, Nick and Dirk, you both had thoughts about this in the past. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak from a cross-border payments angle, yes. right, rather than a domestic payments angle, um, because that's, the, that's our kind of competence, right? Um, I think what, what was interesting as we did uh, our experimental work last year, and, the, and in particular the sandbox experimentation, was 
the, the role of intermediaries was one of the, the, the topics that you, as you might expect uh, we, we kind of looked into uh, into quite quite deeply and and at, you know Francesca's slide on this was was pretty uh, I think was informative of drawing that two by two because um, I think if you if you believe um, that um, that a CBDC is going to likely stay on its own home network and there's sound very sound kind of monetary policy reasons why a central bank would want it to stay on its home network and if you believe that um, that access models to domestic payment systems for foreign institutions will not radically change as a result of CBDCs. Um, and, you know, we could debate that for a quite long time, but I think that that's a fairly, in my mind, it's a fairly sound assumption. Then you will need intermediaries to continue to, to be, be present in some form. We were very careful and conscious in the sandbox report that I've talked about to call them intermediaries rather than correspondent banks, because though that role could considerably evolve over over time, depending on what obligations are taken on by the, the actual payments system it's, itself versus the role of, uh, role of individual, uh, individual um, banks. So um, I guess from that perspective, um, we will still, in my view, need, need for, at least cross-border payments, uh, you know, quite a lot of the, the players that, that we have today. Having said that, the, the, what, we're, what we're, we're trying to do with the solution we're creating and also with the what was, I think, a clear consensus amongst the participants, the 18 participants in our sandbox, was that we actually want to come out with a, with a, a situation here where those payments are, are, are faster and, less, uh, uh, and are more frictionless than they are today. So we don't just want to replicate what happens today, but actually want to create a genuinely useful s solution that takes takes the, the sort of financial system forward and also with that helps central banks to realise the diverse sets of benefits they're trying to achieve from, from CBDCs. Thank you, Nick. Um. So I think we'll, in the next 10 years we'll see many, many more central banks adopting retail CBDC. Uh, quite a few of them will not do it because they are convinced but because they see the others are doing it so they feel they have to do it themselves as well. As a consequence, we'll see major changes in the structure, in the monetary architecture in societies, which has huge benefits potentially, but uh, major political economy risks. Um, and I think every, every bank in crisis that we'll live through in the next, the next 10 years, 15 years, whatever, will, will amplify that, will, will you know, uh, contribute additional push and pressure to these developments. Thank you.